It provides a cultural opportunity for students as well as the community to explore the rich heritage of St. Bernard and the New Orleans area. Guys that don't take any uh, uh, 
I guess he doesn't take any awards or prison presidents for us, all that, but he is the guy that put this on five years ago. And each year we've gotten a little bit better. I'm very, very happy. So without further ado, I'll get into this. Uh, I want you to know that uh, uh, we have three presenters tonight, and all of three of them are very close. If I can keep the first one down a little bit, we're going to be in good shape. Uh, but having said that, uh, the big one we have with us tonight, and we want to really thank him for coming. There's two of them, two of them besides Ron Chapman. It's the Al Waller. He's going to come up here and make his presentation. Incidentally, he's done his homework from what I understand, and his. Uh, very up to date on all of this. And of course, the most important one we have is Dr. Sherwood Gagliano. Uh, people call him Woody Gagliano. Uh, he is, I guess, the top expert in this field. So New York Community College is very fortunate to have him with us. We're very humbled and honored that you did come, Dr. Gagliano, and we look forward to your words of wisdom. And we hope we can show a lot of it on the screen so you can see. The topic is, you know, what, what happened really? I think you can see some beautiful shots from, uh, from Ron Chapman. And then what are the solutions? And both Mr. Waller and uh, Dr. Gagman are going to give us some of those solutions. So without further ado, I'd like to have Ron Chapman come on up and, and start the program. Thank you very much. Thank you. Greetings. As you're all good making here. Things are a little bit different than they used to be. We used to have comfortable reclining chairs, so uh, but this is better than the FEMA trailer, isn't that? <laughs> but with no further ado, we get started. As I said, the format is I'll do a presentation on just exactly what happened. Uh, Al Waller will then follow up with he was uh, chairman of the subcommittee of the Citizens Recovery Committee for St. Bernard Parish on Coastal Restoration. He worked very close with Dr. Dagliano. But uh, Al was in the presentation a lot of talking about the Dagliano's going to come up and do a question and answer period because he's the expert that knows the most about it. So with no further ado, we'll begin. First, I want you to look at this opening slide here. And uh, it's impressive, isn't it? I remember when I was in Natchez watching the storm coming in, I looked at my wife and I said, this is absolutely gorgeous. It's a meteorological wonder. It's going to kill us. <laughs> and it did, you know. So the title of this one is Katrina, What Really Happened, and Solutions for the Future. I have a little poem that was written by Annette Accomando, one of the members of the faculty here. There is there, it is the time to cry, moss sleep, herons fly, squirrels flee, possum sigh, deer relocate, cypress die. Tall gray trunks on the azure sky, the lifeless logs become their own tombstones, as no one buries these dead. Few lament their loss, materialism and capitalism reign supreme. Man makes tearless excuses, a ship channel is their dream. There is money to be made, there are jobs to be had. It is a time to cry. And you reflected what happened down there, it's so poignant. Okay, wetland lost. This is a satellite photograph of Louisiana. And you can see basically, this is what's basically called the Delta, the area of the Mississippi River. This is the Red River coming down, and this forms the Louisiana Delta here. You can also see the amount of water that's surrounding us. Now we'll roll back here. The Delta is young. You look at it. It goes back about 5,000 years. And you know, if you wash your car and you have a hose, and you turn the water on, and the hose whips back and forth, and you're trying to walk down and stop it. That's basically what the Mississippi River did. It would swing back and forth and back and forth, spewing out all this fresh water and silt. And that's what built the deltas. You can see it rolls from here, goes to two, then three, then four is basically the, uh, the St. Bernard Delta. That's 2,000, 2,600 years ago, 1,500 years ago. That's what created one of the offshore bars there, the Chandelier Islands, okay? Then it switched back down, but if you notice, the last two most recent deltas are in the chain here. They aren't swinging anymore. Since 1718, with Parker, we started building levees. We started controlling the river. So this process of swinging back and forth and redeveloping the, the wetlands by bringing in more silt and fresh water, we stopped and began the process of stopping a long time ago. What is the impact? This is an estimate of what the wetlands looked like in 1839. Pay particular attention, you can see how small Lake Bourne is. In you know, Lake Omaha, Lake Pontchartrain, this is a little bit of Lake Bourne, but look at the land mass you have protecting us. This is a little bit of New Orleans area. You get to 1870, you can already see the beginning. Now you have the formation of Lake Bourne much better. As you can see the amount that's disappearing. This is 1993. 
So you can see the problem is the amount of wetlands loss we have. All of that natural barrier that was once there is now gone. This is a satellite photo. This is New Orleans. This is the Industrial Canal. This is the Mr. Go. This is the Intercoastal Waterway. This is Shal Nice Water and Shal Net right here. What we're looking at is when the storm came in, remember the winds are rotating in a counterclockwise direction. As it came in, it pushed the water. And there's some controversy about the storm. Some people say, well, no, it was a big category three. No, it was a category four. No, it was a category five. As we see the sand, the track, you'll see it was a category five for a long time. It created a massive wall of water at that stage. I remember talking to Bob Turner on the boat, Scotia or uh, Prince. And he told me, he called up the National Weather Service before the storm hit and asked for it, the tidal surge at Breton Sound buoy. And the guy told him, you don't want to know. He says, no, I really have to know, okay? He says, all right, I'll tell you. It's 48-foot tidal surge with 16 to 18-foot seas. He says, Bob, you've got a 60-foot wall of water coming at you at 15 miles an hour. He said, I hung the phone up and I started to cry. He says, because I realized there was absolutely nothing we could do. This would overwhelm us. And the reasoning is, because the water, as this tidal surge, as this wind was pushing from the east initially until it moved inland, it drove the water up to Mr. Go and packed it in all around here into Lake Bourne. It wasn't just Mr. Go, it was Lake Bourne. It was filling up with water as well. And as Dan Kaluta, who argued with the Corps for 20 years, who always said, it's the funnel effect. And what the funnel effect is, the levee on this side, coupled with the levee from the industrial, I mean, uh, the, the waterway, and it goes to waterway, creates this triangle, and as the water builds up, it gets trapped in here, and it builds up to the height of the levee, and it raises in height rather than lowers in height. The core for years said the more inland the tidal surge gets, the lower it gets. He says, no, it doesn't. It gets bigger. Mississippi River and the uh, Gulf Outlet. This is the same view taken closer. You can see here the Mississippi River Gulf Outlet. The estimates are about 40,000 acres of cypress swamp has been destroyed since it opened up. So the damage is not just the fact that the channel was built and the fact that it eroded from 500 feet to 3,000 feet, but it's the fact that all the salt water that came on killed off all these marshes around the surrounding area, which were the natural barriers to storms, coupled with the fact that as they dug this thing in, as I appreciate it, there were three to four natural barriers that came through their ridges that they cut through to create it. This is a view here of Mr. Go showing the amount of erosion. This is at the junction with Lake Bourne, so you can see the boundary with Lake Bourne has practically disappeared. Times Creek Union, this is February 19, 2005. Portions of Sentinel and Plaquemine interior marshes are, de are deteriorating accelerated rate. Land losses through Mr. Go, 1974, 387 acres per year, 83 to 90, 374 acres per year, 1,157 acres a year. And they didn't know why it was occurring. Perhaps Dr. Gagliano could give us some insights into that. What we're seeing is a marsh being lost at a rate that exceeds the national digging of a canal. The Blow Bill saved 8,400 acres in 14 years. The land lost in 14 years was 201,000 acres. So you can see the efforts to rebuild our wetlands are lagging desperately behind the erosion. There's a huge gap here. Obviously, there is. This is what a healthy swamp would look like. I'm not saying this is directly what it looked like out there initially. When you talk to people that I knew who passed away now from Delacroix Island, Frank Lopez, people like that, they talked about hunting brown bear and black bear at Delacroix Island, about the hardwood forests that were out there. So this is the type of pictures that you would see in a healthy swamp. So if a tidal surge tried to come through that, it would be inhibited. Look at the size of that cypress. That's an old growth cypress. And they used to grow bigger than that. I've seen photographs of full lumbermen standing next to each other, holding their broad axes, and the tree was wider than the four of them standing abreast of one another. So this is actually a small one, when you consider what they used to be like. Okay, now what do we have? That's us. This was taken before the storm. Okay, this is right off uh, 510, Parish Road. Look at, you can see with the remains of the trunks scattered about, but there's nothing there. Causes? The levee system prevents replenishing of the water system because by putting up the levees, we prevented the water. Mississippi River always overflowed its boundaries. If you read the early records of the Council of uh, DeSoto's men, Moscoso, and then they talk about how they wake up one morning and the Mississippi River levee so overflowed this, as far as they can see, it's like an ocean. Well, it's all fresh water that's depositing silt. When we put the levees up, that natural process stopped. Navigation canals, like the Mr. Go, like the Intercoastal Waterway. All canals, we know that every time they build an oil well, the oil canals, they have to do the connect to the rigs. That contributed to it, allowing saltwater intrusion to come in. 
All drilling caused subsides due to regional depressurization. It's a simple matter. If you suck all the oil, keep sucking the oil and, and gas out of the ground, the ground's going to subside. Take a, take a wet sponge and suck the water out of it. What does it do? General geological subsidence. This is something that you don't hear too much about, and I talked at length with uh, Stephen Stoke and all about it. The plate, and perhaps Dr. Gagliano can explain more about it, upon which the delta is built, is sinking geologically. So you add all the human created problems onto this very natural process. Local litigation, because what happened is they started coming up to freshwater siphons, but when the salt water came in, it opened up land for oysters. So the state leased the oyster land out to the oyster fishing. Well, then when they opened up the freshwater siphons, it changes the salinity. These people then lose their leases. They file suit because that's their livelihood, and you end up in litigation. So then they shut the siphons down, or it inhibits the process of creating more siphons which is what we need. Siphons are basically freshwater diversions to reintroduce the freshwater into the marshes. And of course, nutria. People are amazed at the amount of damage nutria can do to a living marsh. Why was New Orleans so vulnerable? As you can see, this is the city of New Orleans, and you can again see all the water around it. You can see what little of the delta remains, the bird foot, so to speak. This is the city of New Orleans in 1700. If you drive down I-55 and you look off at Lake Montpaws, you go down and see how the, the water disappears into little cypress swamps, and turn around and disappears. That's what the edge of Lake Pontchartrain used to look like. That's where Marie Laveau used to have the White House where she did all her voodoo dances and all of that. In the 1920s, around 1923 or 24, they built the seawall out in the lake, and then they back pumped sand onto it to elevate it. That's what created the bowls. So you see where the highland is, is light. This is the old bed of uh, Bayou Metairie. This is the bed of, of Bayou Gentilly. It forms this Y here. And this is the, the coastline right alongside of the Mississippi River, where it overflows. When it overflows, the heaviest silt falls first. Then when they filled this area in here, and then built the industrial canal in, what you ended up with, these are the highs. So you built your bowl. You had your two high rims and everything sunk in between. Then they put the drainage canals in and located the pumps on this end so they could pump the water out so they could populate these areas and then pump it out and let it drain into the lake. Okay? The problem is they never put any bricks, any gates at these lot locks. You know, and that was the problem of Hurricane Betsy. I grew up right in this neighborhood here and you know, water came in early in the morning and we were told to get out because the London Avenue Canal levee had broken. It would have flooded the entire area inside these canals here. That was perhaps one of the greatest political quotes I've ever heard in my life was Vic Skirrell when he said, don't believe any false rumors, can you hear them from me? Remember that one? That was because they, the rumor was that the levee had broken. That was in 1965. They thought they lost a city. Why they didn't put floodgates at the head of these canals in the 40 years since that time is anyone's guess. This is an elevation map showing the city of New Orleans. These areas here are the highest. As you get down, you get to the green, which is zero to two, minus two feet to minus four feet. Up in this area here, which is like, this is uh, Gentilly Boulevard, this would be Franklin Avenue. Up in here, you're looking at minus 9 to minus 12 feet. So that's why when the water filled in, it filled in a lot. This is an interesting elevation map here. And to look at the numbers, of, you see they have A, B, you see 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. This is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. These are the numbers. And what this does is it shows the elevation. So this would be here, Lake Shore Drive. This would be the Mississippi River. And if you draw a line across here, you'll see where it's not one bowl. It's about 32 different bowls that filled up with water. And if you see a ridge like here, the water filled up to this, that would be the little spot to dry land where somebody happened not to get water, the randomness of it. You can also see here some of these other little ridges and hollows that were in there. you got a little house in that hollow. All of a sudden, you got about 17 feet when you're next to a neighbor and virtually nothing. So this is a great elevation map. Interesting thing here is, look at the industrial canal because that's this here, this elevation. It crosses right here. It's number six, okay? Look how high that is. It's as high as the Mississippi River Levee. So the net effect, what it does is, it cuts this off. So New Orleans East, the Ninth Ward, and back here, Chalmette, is effectively totally separated by this major wall from the rest of the city of New this is a scary one. Down here is a photograph of the delta of Louisiana. Up above is everything that's one foot, above one foot above sea level. There's not much there. So everything that's one foot or below is light gray. This, look at this. 
There's nothing there. That just goes to show how vulnerable we are to any type of a title search. Past storms. This is an interesting one. Oh, let me go back. I have to go back. Where my arrow go? There it is. Got me there? Thank you. All right. This is one of the reasons I always tell my students beware. It's not if, it's when. It's like playing dodgeball. Look at the number of storms that have come through this particular area. Now, what I want you to pay particular attention to is this red line. Okay? This thing came off of a Corps of Engineers slide, a lecture that was done by Al Naomi here about four years ago. This is, if you can't really see it, it's this critical path to New Orleans. This is a kind of a blow up of the same thing. These are all the different storms that came through. Okay? 1947. You hear about the 1947 uh, we're talking about? This is in the track of the 1947 hurricane. This is Hurricane Betsy. So you can see it passed way south of this. This is the critical track A. Look where she goes. Katrina, look where she goes. It not only followed the critical track, it was the largest storm ever to hit the mainland of the United States. This is its track here as it followed through. We all remember, you know, here's where she reached category five, and she dropped down to category possibly four, some argue three. More likely four as it came in. The problem was it was like a super tanker at sea. It was doing 18 knots and you pull it to stop. The boat's not going to stop. And the tidal surge that it created as a category five was still there, even though the wind subsided a little bit. And it's that tidal surge that came in that got us. That's another magnificent shot. Look at that. It looks like you've got the eye, you have an inner eye, then you have it's almost like three eyes superimposed on one. I mean, that is, you know, when you think about it from an meteorological perspective, it is incredibly beautiful and symmetrical, but it is a killer, as we all know. There's a blow-up of it, so you can really see, you know, the symmetry of this thing, the power of this thing. We're looking at over 180 mile an hour sustained winds, and God only knows what the gusts came up to. Here's a few more shots, randomly taken. This one here, Shows it right when it comes into it. It's kind of hard with the light on it, but it's crossing right over St. Bernard Parish. So basically, Chalmette is on the outer eye wall, it looks like, as best as I can see. And this is when we got it. Because as all that water was built in, when this storm moved in and that wind <laughs> turned from the north, all the water in Lake Vaughan and all the water that had been run up uh, uh, this to go came up against that levee. The levee catastrophically failed, as you'll see and that wall of water came into the St. Bernard Parish. This is a picture of it. This is St. Bernard down here. This is now it just moved inland. If you look at the winds, the winds are now coming out the west. So it's starting to blow some of the water out. But a levee system is a two-edged sword. It will keep water out, but once the water gets in, you can't get it out. And that's the problem. Maybe if there would have been such a good levee system, or such a levee system, we should just use the adjective there, it would have blown some of the water out. But because it was trapped on the levee system, it stayed. And that's when it sat for weeks and weeks and weeks. It had to be pumped out, but you pumped and your electrical grid's all in the water. This is just another picture of the storm, and it shows 15 mile an hour speed, 150 mile an hour winds. You subtract the 15 uh, from the speed, wind speed on this side, you add it on this side. So there's the Gulf Coast got 165 mile an hour winds and about a 28 foot tidal surge. This is a barrier island. Look at this. These arrows are pointing to the exact same points. Barrier islands are critical because that's what protects us. That's our first line of defense. If we're going to protect ourselves, it's like in the military, it's called defense in depth. You've got to meet the enemy far away and whittle them down. We buy in for time. You're not going to stop a storm like this. The only thing you can do is buy for time and try to reduce it, reduce it, reduce it in stages as it comes in. That's what Dr. Gagliano will get into. This is another one. Look at this. This is here. Look at it now. This is August 31st. This is two days after the storm. Two days after the storm. Look at this. Look at this. It's frightening. I understand uh, Colonel Dysart said something to the effect one time that we generally lose 25 square miles of land a year. Katrina took 58 square miles away from just southeast Louisiana in 24 hours. Here's another one. Look how much is gone. 
And this is what we have to bring back if we hope to have any, any protection. Same here. Look, these two points here, there's nothing there. Look at this here. It's gone. New Orleans, this shows you what happened. This is the 17th Street Canal. Now, if you look at this out in the graphic over here, this is still flooded as of October 2nd. This is the lake, is the area that flooded. This is the area that was still flooded. This is the London Avenue Canal. It broke on both sides. The Industrial Canal broke on both sides. So this is what flooded the lower ninth ward. If you talk to people in the Sheriff's Department, they'll tell you that they were sitting here at the courthouse and they got a call from the substation saying, hey man, we're getting water. Come get us. And the water just came in actually like a white water rapid that said, came washing down. The next thing you know, water started coming from the north as well. And they were caught in the salmon with the two tidal surges that came in. One of them coming from the Industrial Canal, the other one coming from the Mystic Go, but mostly you know, the uh, Lake Bourne. This shows the area of flooding. Look at this. You're looking at over 12 feet of water. This is Paris Road coming in. So you can see, this is a few days later. And I have honestly a little bit of difficulty with this because my house is right off Paris Road. They make it look like I only have about two or three feet of water. My house is four feet off the ground and I had seven feet of water in it. So I have a little bit of a discrepancy here. My water line doesn't quite match with this graphic. But nevertheless, it still shows you the amount of flooding. Here you see the 17th Street Canal. And this side flooded, this didn't, but it washed up the back through Airline Highway took out, this is uh, Metairie Road, it took out all the back of Metairie Road. This is the bridge of 17th Street Canal. This is after they sandbagged it. This is the bridge of 17th Street Canal. Interesting thing here, look. It's the water line. The lake has become the city of New Orleans. Remember how it was a bowl? The bowl's ruptured. You are now, you are now the lake. This is an overhead shot of uh, the bridge at the industrial canal. If you notice, the water is coming back from here. This is after the storm has passed. So all the water was pushed into the night floor. Look at this, there's nothing there. Because when this levee broke and pushed through, it just blew all the houses away with the force of the water. I talked to a, 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 a black gentleman the other day, I was with a film crew from San Francisco, and he was telling me, that, you know, he was crying as he was talking about it. He stayed. He says, I literally saw ladies holding their babies, their bodies floating in the water. So where did these people go? Likely some of them that lived in this area here. This tide pulled out. Look at the speed of the tides coming up. Was washed out from the industrial canal into the lake. This is a view from the uh, Claiborne Bridge. Look at that. Look at this. I mean, that's almost like a class five rapid. You can take that in a raft, and you can see the amount of water here. This is the flooded area. Satellite photo of the flooding of the city of New Orleans. Isn't that amazing? This is what's dry. This is a little lip here. And if you notice, you know, here, along the edge here, and look, you notice that Y? That was in the original map from 1700. That's the only area that's above water. St. Bernard Parish. This is what got us, folks. Breached, top to moderate damage, top to minor damage, no visible damage. Look at this. This area is no data available. I think I can tell you what happened. Look at the breaches. They have 34 breaches in the levee system. Look at this. The whole levee catastrophically failed. That water came straight through at us, and when it hit the back levee, you find you have breaches where they have the red numbers, and then you have moderate damage here. The back levee actually held better than the Mr. Go levee, but it was only, if I'm not mistaken, somewhere between five to eight feet in height. According to Bob Turner, his contention and his calculations are that had this levee held, at the speed the storm was moving, even with the tidal surge they had, yes, it would have been overtopped. But by the time it got overtopped across the marsh, overtopped, we might have had two feet of water in the lower areas of Paris. But because this levee catastrophically failed, there was absolutely nothing stopping the surge from coming in. These are some pictures taken. Now, you know you go over, the, we call it the Green Bridge, right? We all know it's gray and rusty now. You know that little uh, energy power plant they have on the side there? A gentleman was on stationed at that plant, and he had a camera. These are the pictures he took of looking towards Mr. Go. This is over the Green Bridge. Isn't that amazing? Now think about this for a second. This water is coming over the levee towards the north. Look at the trees, Ben. It's coming against the north wind. Isn't that phenomenal? Look at that. You don't think he was scared? It doesn't look real. Look at the seeds. This is Shalmet back here, folks. Look at it coming over. There's the foot of the bridge, the footing. 
You can imagine what was on this guy's mind. Huh? I'm surprised he got the courage to sit there and just snap pictures. Didn't drop two of his feet. <laughs> no, I probably would have. Look at the size of these seats. Here's his talks. Look at this. He just started there taking pictures. It's starting to spill over the wall. Here you see now it's starting to break over where the cars are and pour down the other side. Again, you can see in the distance the trees all bent. This one here is bent this way, so it's still fighting the north wind. And here you have a bridge finally where he is. Now once this starts coming through, it's going to cut. Once that turf is taken away, it will cut through that uh, mud like hot butter. And then it will form a breach and then this will start widening. This is the flooding in St. Bernard Parish. You can see how dark it is right here. You're looking at 10 to 15 feet. We know at Buckingham Villanoff, this is Paris Road. So this is Buckingham Villanoff. You know, we know. We live there, right? Second story, five feet of water. Absolutely unbelievable. I remember talking to my dear friend Becky Liberday saying that she saw, it felt more like the water, Becky, correct me if I'm wrong, actually washed up against the levee and washed back again. You know, and she lives right on the Mississippi River levee. Okay, she lives on the other side of St. Bernard Highway. So this will give you an idea of the violence of what took place and the amount of flooding. Down here, interestingly enough, you see it's high land. That's around Cordres. That's where the levee was blown in 1927, in 1927 flood. And when they flooded at that time then, the amount of silt that poured through that, that crevasse created this high land. This is uh, Lexington. And this is Lexington after. That's a cement slab house that floated. Absolutely unbelievable, the violence of the sun. So with that, we look at what happened. First, lessons of Hurricane Betsy were not learned. The floodgates weren't put up. The levees weren't drilled to the proper height. I remember talking to Dane Paluta back about six years ago. We were talking about the levees and Mr. Go, and I was upset about them. He brought me the levee profile, the levee elevations, and I studied and looked him over and I called Dan up. I said, Dan, I said, they're supposed to be 18 feet and 14 feet, right? He says, yes. Yeah. So I'm looking at these elevations. I've seen 11 and a half feet between the Green Bridge and the Industrial Canal. Now, consistently with some dips, but 11 is as good as its highest point, or its lowest point, I should say. It's like this chain. I said, but my question is this, Dan. What do they measure this height from? He said, well, they measure them from geodesic medallions. I said, when was the last time they checked the height of the medallion? 1984. So that 14-foot levee, which by their own profile was 11 and a half feet, might have been 10 and a half. Might have been nine and a half. Depends on how much it subsided. Just last summer, before the storm hit, they were starting to go out there and seek these medallions and doing using GPS to get elevations. Uh, does Hawkeye just say, I don't know if we ever found out, did they ever report back to us on the elevations? Never did. We knew they were doing it though, right? But they never did come back and I think they were afraid to tell us because if it had subsided as much as some think, then those levees were so far below grade, it's absolutely frightening. At the same time, they weren't maintained, they weren't armored, they weren't built of the proper material, and they weren't the right height. Okay? No floodgates were erected at the heads of the drainage canals. Had that simple thing been done, the city of New Orleans, west of the industrial canal, would have been saved. Levees along this to go were not raised at proper height, were not constructed proper materials, were not armored, were not maintained. Levees along Lake Bourne, were never constructed. That might have inhibited the surge to some extent. It was never done. Initially, if you look at the Tidelands project, there was supposed to be a lock on the Mystico environment. That was never done. Garnier Islands were allowed to deteriorate, which would provide impedance to storm surge at a distance. The federal government did not spend $10 billion for levee protection, but will spend $100 plus billion to repair property damage, not to call it coming loss of lives. Alan Naomi sat right here about four years ago and said he was looking for Congress to allocate $10 billion to put a hurricane levy four or five into Louisiana, and he couldn't get them to allocate the money. They're spending more than that on feed materials now. So catastrophic failure of federal levy systems destroyed one of America's oldest and historic metropolitan areas. With that, I'll turn it over to uh, Al. Thank you so much. I sure wish I learned how to jump. <laughs> One thing I did learn how to do uh, on the CRC was I learned how to duck. Any, anytime we started talking about the MRGO, we, we had to learn how to duck. We also had to learn where the exits were, and I know they got them right back. 
we're not going to talk about the, the challenge. The reason that Dr. Warner didn't give me any credentials in my introduction is because I have one. My only credentials are that for the last 42 years I've spent practically every spare moment I had over above my family in the marshes and the waters of St. Mark Parish chasing cliffs. So I've seen a lot of the changes, you know, seen what has happened to our coast. And just to give you a little brief history about the, the CRC and how I got involved, uh, Dave Gormley called me and said, man, you know, we, we need some, some folks involved in this. Uh, would, would you participate? So I said, sure, you know, I'll, I'll be there. And, you know, when I went to the first meeting, we kind of looked around and we started choosing up sides who was going to be on, on what committee. And uh, none of us had any credentials, but we, we, had to, we had to study quick and learn fast. And uh, there was some really good people on that committee with me. Uh, Steve Salas, who's, who's here tonight. Don DePlanche. I don't know if Don came in or not. I got the light light on, so I can't see. South from Savannah. We had help from a tremendous amount of people. We had a task, basically, 60 days uh, to come up with a plan. And it wasn't just something that we could, it wasn't something we could just put on paper and say, you know, here, LRA, here's the plan. We, we knew privately, we talked about this, that we had to feel confident, have enough confidence in our plan so that we could tell our friends and our family, people we love, that it was okay to come back if we did this. And, and, and I have to tell you folks, that's what we did. We sat down, we spent literally hundreds of hours looking at all the available information. And in 60 days, let me point this out too, you don't have time to develop a whole lot of new information. So we had to, we had to look at what was out there already. We, we depended on a lot of good people, a lot of people in the community that had already been there, done that. Uh, to, too numerous to mention. Dr. Warner told me that if I take more than 15 minutes, he's going to throw something at me, so I don't want that to happen. Um, we had, you know, folks like Dr. Gaglian, uh, John Lopez, Dr. Lopez with the Lake Country Basin Foundation, uh, Colton Dufour Show with the Basin Foundation. We met with the Corps of Engineers and their folks numerous times, and, and any number of experts that were provided to us by FEMA. So we took all of that information that we could gather up and we in 60 days, basically, or a little over 60 days, we came up with a plan. And I'm just going to briefly go over our plan with you and then I'll be available for questions afterwards and uh, you know, we, can, uh, we can talk about it. Now, Ronnie, I told you I'm not an IT guy, so if I get in trouble, you can help me, right? Okay, we basically came up with 13 projects and we all of these projects are inclusive of each other. They're not, they're not mutually exclusive. They're, they're designed to work as a multiple line of defense. And that's not a term that, that, that Steve and Don and I came up with. That's something that we coined the phrase by Dr. John Lopez. That's something he brought to the table. And, and the other thing that we had to look at was you know, coastal restoration sometimes we get lost on that, is a real long-term prospect. It's not something that you do overnight. But we had to set a time frame of zero to five years to, to develop projects and to put them in place so that, you know, they would protect the citizens of St. Mark Parish and ultimately the people of, of Metropolitan New Orleans. Uh, we didn't have 10, 15, 20 years to try to to, to do some land building and some marsh restoration and all of those kind of warm, fuzzy things. We had to look at, you know, what are we going to do about storm surge? What are we going to do to protect ourselves? So these projects, a lot of them are already in place. Like, for instance, the, the Carnarvon project. What we did was we came along and we, we changed it a little bit. We said, hey, let's take some of the, the sediment that's at Carnarvon, at Lake Larry, and let's pump it out into the adjacent marsh. Marshes. That's something that we can do relatively fast and will provide meaningful storm surge protection. Okay. 
Next project was reestablish the body of the Lucha Bridge. It was shown uh, in some of the satellite photographs that Bayou La Lutra, although it's, the ridge is pretty much gone, for those of y'all who have been out the marsh, know about Bayou La Lutra, it, you know, that ridge is, has been traditionally a very high ridge, and it's, it's almost completely gone. But even, even though it's, it's degraded to a point to where it may be two or three feet above the mean sea level, it did provide some storm surge protection in this last hurricane, and that was shown by some of the storm surge so we, what, we, what we've said is that we, we feel like restoring that ridge is, is a very important factor and also at the same time coming along in conjunction with the ridge and narrowing the MRGO to a width of 125 feet and a depth of 12 feet for a, a length of, of 2,500 feet. MRGO land bridge at Lake Bourne, that's basically that area that you've heard talked about, uh, the funnel effect, or better known is when you go over the Green Bridge and you look to your right and you, now you see Lake Bourne basically, you know, at the bridge. Well, that's that area and that's what we're talking about rebuilding. And we feel like that that's a, a doable project in the short term and something that needs to be Restoration and siphon at Violet Miro. We already have a siphon at Violet. And the reason we threw Miro in there is because Mr. Dean came up with an idea of, of using some of the Miro land as possibly a spillway or another siphon site. And, and we said, you know what? That, you know, let, the, let the engineers lead us to where it needs to be. We, we feel like there's already something at Violet. We could go in and rehabilitate it. There's already some projects on the boards in the works to do that. We feel like by, by reintroducing uh, fresh water into the central wetlands, that's that area between uh, the 40 Orchid Canal levee and the MRGO levee, uh, we could re reduce storm surge. Bob Turner with Lake Punch Stream, uh, excuse me, with Lake Bourne Levee District basically told us when the storm surge came across the levee at Violet, it was 22 feet at the locks. By the time it reached the 40 off the canal levee, it was 12 feet. So there's some meaningful storm surge reduction in that marsh area, and if we can rebuild it and replenish it, it would be worthwhile doing. The interior levee, 40 off the levee, uh, basically, you know, we, we looked at it from a logical standpoint. Why would you have your last line of defense lower than your than the line of defense out on the MRGO, the first line. You, you, you absolutely wanted at least as high as that, that outer ring level. So we, we felt like raising the design height of the 40 off the canal level to 17 and a half feet was just a logical thing to do. Arming of the MRGO levees, well, this is old news. Everybody knows that of engineers have said now that if we build a levee, we're going to arm it. When we came up with this idea, talking to some of the folks at the Corps of Engineers, it was just a, it was basically in the talking stage. So everybody's agreed that this is a good thing to do. It's an absolute now. If you're going to build a levee, you got to arm it. Storm surge barrier across Lake Bourne. I'll let Dr. Gagnon talk about this some more. This is a, a, a longer term project. It's something that if we're gonna, if we're gonna really, if we're gonna really protect ourselves from Lake Bourne, we're gonna have to figure out a way to to buffer storm surge and water coming across Lake Bourne. This was a, an effective way to do it. Cypress Islands project. Uh, uh, this is a an idea that we came up with, uh, kind of toward the, the tail end of our process. We started talking to some folks that uh, had some abandoned barges and ships. And they said, look, you know, we, we environmentally clean these things, and they're free if you want. So we said, okay, well, how can we use these, these, these ships and barges? Started thinking about it. Why not take them and fill them up sort of like a peanut shell? You know, you could fill it up with, with uh, we 
talk about filling up with debris from my house. It's good to <laughs> fill it up with, with you know, filled material, sand, clay, what have you, uh, and, and sink these barges in place. One of the problems that we have is that you know we were constantly sinking. Ron, you know, talked a little bit about the, the data measurements that they're using in those benchmarks and, and how much uh, subsidence has, has caused problems for us. Well, by, by using some of these containers, if you will, sort of like a giant flower pot, you know, we can kind of counteract some of that because they'll, they'll not sink quite as rapidly. Biloxi Land Bridges North and South. Some of y'all are probably familiar with, with uh, the Biloxi Marsh area. This area is probably as critical as any marsh complex there is in Southeast Louisiana to storm surge protection from, for the whole metro area, and a lot of people really don't know a lot about it. We, this is a critical component. Restoring these land bridges so we can slow water down coming into Lake Bourne and ultimately Lake Pontchartrain, Lake Marapaw is, is just critical to, uh, to being able to survive these major storms. Barry Island restoration at uh, Gosha and Breton Island, basically what we're calling for Connect Gosha and Breton Island, which by the way, the MRGO runs right through the middle of those two islands right now. And part of our project would be to, to create a 15 mile solid barrier island chain, and it would effectively close the channel at its mouth. Uh, Lake Robin Shoreline, Martin Barrier Construction. This is basically building a line of barrier islands that in the Black Bay. Uh, Bay LY area. I was telling uh, Dr. Gagnon I was out there Saturday and that was the first time I had really been what we would call the outside, which is the, the edges of the Gulf. And a lot of those barrier islands that were out there pre-Katrina are not there anymore. Smaller islands. And, and this would be a project where we would go in and create uh, just miles and miles of these, these barrier islands that would be closer to St. Bernard Blackman's Parish so that, you know, it would break storm surge down and slow water down coming into our interior marshes. It's very critical. Same project, just basically uh, to the north of the channel. Freshwater diversion by the mud. Bayou Lamuck is in Plaquemines Parish, and a lot of people ask, well, why did you, why did you throw this one in there if it's in Plaquemines? Well, you know, Plaquemines Parish kind of jets out to our southeast, and we need it as storm protection, just like Orleans and Jefferson need us. So, you know, there's about six different projects that um, scientists in the Louisiana coastal area and Coast 2050 plans have identified in Plaquemines Parish on the East Bank that would benefit not only Plaquemines, but would benefit St. Bernard as well. We felt like this was a, a doable project, quickly done, would move a lot of water, and could possibly rebuild some marsh banks. Well, that, that concludes my presentation. I think I do. I, do I have 60 seconds left, Ron? <laughs> Something I want to mention to you folks is uh, one thing that's got to happen in our community. We talked. I was talking to Dr. Gagnon about it earlier. Is you know, there's the, over the past 20 to 30 years, there's only been a few people. In <laughs> a few folks, in, I guess that's my cue. A few folks in St. Bernard Parish that have been involved in coastal restoration. Uh, you know, there's, there's some people in this room, one of them that comes to mind right off the bat is Gation lived there. Gation spent his whole life working on coastal restoration in St. Bernard Blackens. But he's one of a few people that have been involved in, in this issue. And, I, and I, I'll tell you just quickly, the proof to that is I started getting involved in going to some of the MRGO closure meetings pre-Katrina. And the last one that I went to at the complex, I believe, was in March of 05. And 
there were about 80 people there from St. Bernard Parish. I kind of picked my brain and thought about this, and there was probably 80 people there. There were probably a total of 200 people there, but probably only 80 from St. Bernard Parish. And I'm thinking to myself, what's wrong with this picture? We've got 67,000 people in St. Bernard Parish, and we got 80 that show up to talk about closing the MRGO. There's something wrong with that. And what we've got to do is we're going to have to, as citizens of St. Bernard, we're going to have to take some personal responsibility here. Everybody's going to have to get involved. And I thought about this as sort of like, like the Israelis do with terrorists. You know, every morning they get up and, you know, they, the first thing they think about is how we're going to protect ourselves. Well, that's what we're going to have to do. And if we don't do that, the folks in Washington, the Corps of Engineers, I'm not going to slam those guys because they got a lot of good people that work for them. And the Department of Natural Resources, and you know, you go on and on and on with the different agencies. They're going to give us what we've always got. An example of that is there's, there's money's in the till right now for St. Bernard Parish. I believe it's about $16 million. And up until about six weeks ago, I don't think we had a project to meet that $16 million that they were going to put on the table for us. And a lot of it has to do with fact that our elected officials are so tied up with everything else that's going on around them. As citizens, we've got to get involved. And it's time consuming, I'll tell you. As a business person and a father and husband and all that kind of stuff, these people are wearing down with meetings. You'll literally have to be a professional meeting person. Don and Plush and I went to a meeting in Baton Rouge and it was an all day thing. And we looked around and there was 31 people in the room and 29 of them were getting paid. <laughs> it was just Don and I who were sitting there and wasn't drawing a check. So I wanted to use part of my time to maybe uh, plant a seed with people in this room. If you're retired, if you're independently wealthy, not too many of us in St. Bernard Parish left like that. If you've got some time on your hands, get involved in this. If you don't have to be an expert, you can learn everything you need to know and in, in a short period of time. It's really not that complicated. It's a very simple concept if you really want to live through the So get involved. Thank you. I want to tell you it's an honor and a privilege to be here tonight. Uh, I particularly want to compliment the two speakers before me. Uh, I think Ron has given you the best uh, summary of the impact of this storm on southeastern Louisiana that I've heard. Uh, it certainly runs circles around some of the summaries that we've had from government agencies. And I think uh, he and the people who helped him with it deserve to be complimented for, for putting this story together while it's fresh because it's very, very important if we're going to uh, protect ourselves from future disasters and rebuild our parish and our state. This is the kind of forensic, geoforensic information we need and we're not doing enough of that. Uh, the second thing I'd like to say is it's been a uh, Al Wallet did a very fine job of, of summarizing a lot of hard work uh, by the committee members and, and others in the parish, working with the parish council and the parish president and other officials in the parish to put together a plan uh, to officially put forward and put in the hopper uh, for the recovery of, of the parish. Uh, and, uh, you know, we, we're all going the same same way I hope. Uh, I see a lot of people here that I've known for a long time and people that I saw in uh, Baton Rouge after the storm and out in the field uh, as we've been recovering. Uh, I, I have a few things that I'd like to show you that I hope will add a little bit to the presentation tonight. Uh, let's see, let me get oriented again. Get, Right place. Probably going the wrong way. Let, let me kind of go back one. Yeah. Okay. I, 
I'd like to, uh, to start with this. Uh, in addition to working in St. Bernard, I've been doing a lot of work in coastal Mississippi, trying to understand the whole storm, or at least that part of it that, that impacted my stomping grounds. And in Mississippi, we, we see, uh, you know, the, the, as you see here, the, the, the power of this monster. And we see it in, in a different way because some of the Mississippi coast is relatively high. And when it hit land, you know, it, it had to climb up on the land, not just climb, knock down levees. And I, I like this, this illustration because it really puts things in perspective for, for all of us, you know, the, the, the elevations and what they do. Uh, that's uh, the two things I particularly may, mainly want to focus on are two concepts. Uh, we, we have a lot of plans. We generally think of, of plans as intangible things. And our challenge right now is to go from concepts to reality. Uh, and to get there in a short period of time without wasting a lot of money and spending our money on the wrong things. Uh, prior to the storm, we had been working for a number of years with the parish on the, the, the problem of closure of the MRGO and uh, remediation and mitigation for all of the damages that it did. And during the course of that work, we, we realized that uh, the, this area was extremely vulnerable to storm surge, and that probably the number one priority in considering closure of the MRGO was to protect uh, St. Bernard Parish and neighboring areas of metropolitan New Orleans and the rest of the Pennsylvania Basin, Plaquemine Parish, St. Tammany Parish, from storm surge in this window uh, to the Gulf of Mexico that exists through Lake Bourne and into Mississippi Sound you saw it so vividly in, in Ron's slides, uh, this funneling effect. And we started realizing that, uh, you know, uh, one classic traditional way of doing that is to build levees. That's what we know how to do. We learned how to do that uh, when we settled this country, and it became known as the New Holland of North America. Uh, so we, we build levees, but we have difficulties because in our terrain, uh, the foundation conditions are so poor, it's very difficult to build up these high enough and strong enough to withstand high energy impacts. So we started saying, well, you know, in other parts of the world, uh, in ancient times and modern times, people who live on open coasts that don't have natural harbors protect their boats and their fishing fleets and so forth by building barricades out into the sea. And we said, well, maybe uh, we need to do that. Uh, you know, another whole approach that has not been applied by the Corps of Engineers in the Gulf or the Atlantic coast is to build a, a breakwater or barrier or barricade out in the open water. And the purpose of such a barricade uh, is twofold. Number one, to absorb wave energy, or energy of the storm as the water is forced toward land, and second, to reduce the elevation of the surge as it moves from across your breakwater, through your breakwater, and before it expends itself uh, on your levee system. Uh, next slide. In pursuing that, we, we looked at some traditional ways of doing things. You know, the classic way in ancient times is to use big rocks. In modern times, we use big concrete uh, tetrahedrons, these things are used all over the world, but you don't have to be too swift to realize that if we place these monster concrete things, big rocks, in Lake Bond, and would sink out of sight in a few years. Next slide. Uh, so we looked around a little further on the websites and the literature and found that uh, there's another pretty old technique that's uh, been used, was used in the Normian. Normandy invasion in World War II to build a port uh, for, the, for our invasion forces to land in France. And that is constructing concrete barges, they call feral concrete barges, uh, and uh, 
floating them in place and then submerging them in the water to build breakwaters. And to my amazement, uh, there's a little company uh, on the uh, GIWW waterway at, at the NASA facility, at the NASA Mitchell now, uh, that's been building these things for about 30 years. And probably some of the preeminent craftsmen, engineers, designers of these, these uh, structures in the world. They're, they're built to, uh, as platforms for uh, oil and gas production facilities, tank batteries, uh, separators, valve complexes, in the shallow waters along the Louisiana coast and in the shallow bottom waters of the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, they build these things uh, on shore, they float them out, they typically put a shell pad down on the, on the ocean bottom, uh, next slide please, and submerge them. Uh, this is a schematic drawing. Uh, we took this concept recently uh, to a two-day workshop that the Corps of Engineers had at the Waterways Experiment Station in Vicksburg uh, to see if we were crazy. You know, the best way to test the concept is to put it before a bunch of experts and you will quickly find out all of the flaws. But we did that and to, to our amazement, uh, the Corps liked the idea and uh, it is now pleased to say incorporated in the findings of the first six month study that the Corps is doing looking at alignments and creative techniques. Uh, this is what kind of came out in the manual. It's a simplistic idea of, of stacking these things, you know, to make a, a barricade. Next slide. Uh, this is another concept that came out of that same conference uh, where the Corps is actually considering building panels that would tilt up uh, out of the marsh or on top of levees and things like that to deflect and break up storm surge. But the, the concept, next slide please, the concept is, is the same. The idea is you want to get a, a, what's called a roughness factor uh, in front of the surge so that when it encounters this, it expends its energy and it reduces the, the water height that goes around it. What we really envision in Lake Barn is a series of, of large barges. This is a schematic of, of a typical unit that might be like 200 feet long and 50 or so feet wide. Uh, it might be 20 feet deep and it might have a panel on top of it that would extend up uh, another 15 feet or, or more depending on the specific application. Uh, it would be submerged in the lake. The lake, the deepest parts of the areas where we submerge, it's only about eight feet. So you'd have a lot of structure sticking up uh, out of the water. Uh, the, you, you have to realize that we're not talking about a rigid wall. What we really like is a series of these things with spaces in between, uh, not intended to be watertight, but simply to to uh, take some of the kick out of the storm. Next slide, please. Uh, we envision an array of these initially across Lake Barn, as I showed you earlier, that would be in front of the levees along the MRGO. It would be outside of the levees along the GIWW. And we could envision other arrays. You know, it may be that we put some further out in the lake, we may need some over here. Uh, I've been exploring the, the, the uses of, of similar structures uh, in Bay St. Louis because the same thing happened in the bays along the Mississippi coast. The, the surge was amplified as it moved into the embayment areas and actually became higher as it went inland. Uh, so the, the same kind of concept. Uh, you know, one of the first reactions you get is, oh my God, what are we going to have an ugly wall out in, in our water bodies in front of our homes? Well, uh, my one response to that is uh, I went to Sydney, Australia a long time ago and the, the, the hallmark, the icon feature of Sydney Harbor is the opera house, the concert hall that is world renowned. It's a symbol of beauty and it's made out of concrete with rebars. You can do a lot of creative things with concrete. You can make curved designs. 
You can make all kinds of designs. So we can start thinking about thinking out of the box and create a, a future landscape that would be uh, blend in with our natural coast. The other thing about this kind of approach is it lends itself very well to multiple use. Uh, I've always been high on uh, fish farming, on, on aquaculture, mariculture, and uh, to grow uh, fish, both shellfish like crabs and uh, even, even shrimp, but, but finfish like redfish and hydrogen striped bass. You need to grow out containers, you need pens where you can circulate seawater. Uh, these, these units would be perfect for that. You, know, you can start envisioning uh, a whole new industry here that would uh, complement the, the natural setting. Carrying that kind of thought a little bit further, you start looking at the, the kinds of things that Al was talking about that we need to do, to do in the great Biloxi marshes. We need to build these barrier islands around the seaward margin. And as I'll show you in a minute, I've, I've also been a big advocate of doing induced, what we call induced oyster reefs to uh, protect the muddy shorelines in all these lakes and embayments and actually add material to the coast. But uh, these features are all uh, changing the landforms. They're changing the hydrology, the way water moves in and out of the area. And the kind of planning that we've been working toward in, 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 in uh, St. Bernard Parish for, for 30 years now is really environmental enhancement. Uh, another feature that Al mentioned that, that is uh, fundamental to this whole idea is the, the construction of another structure on the Mississippi River near Violet that would allow us to introduce fresh water into the central wetlands and eventually into the controlled MRGO channel. Uh, we envision that that same channel could be used to direct fresh water flow into some of these uh, marshes out in the eastern part of the parish and create a much more favorable salinity gradient. It turns out that uh, our neighbors in Mississippi have been begging the state of Louisiana for years to introduce fresh water through the Bonnie Carry floodway so that it would trickle into Mississippi Sound uh, where it would enhance their oyster industry and fishing. They know, as people in St. Bernard knows, that in the years that follow openings of the Bonacari floodway, we usually have a couple of bonanza years uh, in, in our fish harvest, and our oyster harvest, because the, the water not only reduces salinity, but it introduces a lot of nutrients. Uh, consider one more thing, and that is if we put a control gate on the Mississippi River Gulf outlet to keep the storm surge out and salinity out, we're really putting a valve here that allows us to, to, during certain times of the year, to actually let the Gulf waters come in uh, and uh, make changes in the salinity uh, in this whole region. So in, in my view, what we're really creating is a huge experimental uh, managed estuary, probably the first of its kind in the world, where we will have the ability to control some of these marine processes, the inflow and outflow of marine water, uh, introduce fresh water from, from the Mississippi River with sediment in it, control uh, the, the geometry of the basin, compartmentalize it, and, and really uh, further enhance it with uh, fish farming techniques where we might uh, release fin fish uh, into the environment and so forth and so on. Next slide, please. Uh, this is another technique that uh, has a lot of problems. And at first you might say, oh, that's just a feel-good project. But uh, shell reefs, natural shell reefs uh, in southwestern Louisiana form the material that builds the beaches. If you go around Holly Beach and west of, of that along the, the county coast and into Texas, uh, anywhere from 50 to 100 percent of the beach material is made up of shell particles that wash in from 
uh, arose in the Next slide, please. Uh, about 10 years ago, uh, my son and I uh, were in the experimental oyster farming business, uh, trying to, to figure out how to grow uh, market oysters in mesh bags. Uh, that didn't work very well, but uh, one day in the backyard of a barbecue, we put together some wire that we had in the, in the garage and said, well, you know, we can make vertical containers for these oysters, uh, oyster shells that would really make pretty deep reefs. And we did that, and it worked so well that we got a patent for the process. Uh, we tried and tried and tried to do projects in Louisiana. We succeeded in getting one pilot project, but there was a, somehow an inherent resistance. Next slide, please. Uh, oysters are tremendous uh, contributors, not only to habitat conditions, you know, not only as a food source, but natural oyster reefs are, have all kinds of secondary organisms where fish congregate. Any, every fisherman knows that uh, oyster reefs are good places to fish. They also grow uh, very rapidly and produce huge volumes of, of rock. Calcium carbonate is rock. Uh, a 300 pound investment in culch material in one of these reefs uh, in about a two year period will produce over a ton of new oysters. And after that, the process continues. The way it works is that the, the as, as most of you probably know, when uh, the little oyster larvas hatch, they are uh, free swimming. They have kind of eye feature and they look for something to attach to. And this has to be hard, it has to be light colored. Once they attach, they're there for life uh, and they grow. Uh, well, this, this technique is simply to create containers that hold oyster colors off of the bottom in a given geometry so that you can form reefs where they will be of value for protecting the shore from shoreline erosion, uh, for creating habitat for fish and wildlife, uh, and for water purification values and other values. This is a location of our first project uh, that we did about 10 years ago. Uh, the project's still there. It has weathered uh, all of the storms in the last 10 years. And behind the reef, that it's really going to show the reef, but this is outside of the reef. The marsh is still eroding. Behind the reef, there's been silt accumulation. There are oyster clusters in here and uh, uh, several meters of, of oyster pavement on the marsh. Next slide, please. Uh, a year ago, uh, my son, in March of 2005, did a reef project uh, in, along the Texas coast for the Nature Conservancy. Somehow the Nature Conservancy heard about these, this technique and they contracted him to, to do this project. He put in 800 feet of these triangular containers uh, and along the Gulf of the, uh, the shore of the Gulf of Tricosa Waterway. There's a lot of barge traffic there. A lot of shoreline erosion was occurring along the bank. Uh, in that short period of time, uh, we have accreted almost enough silt in here now to plant uh, smooth cord grass uh, the bank erosion has been arrested, and next slide, please. And the reefs are doing beautiful. This is uh, this is growth of, of less than one year. These are all new oysters sticking out. And the idea here is that eventually they fall off and they wash in on the shore where, where they are valued. Uh, we we have next slide, please. Uh, we have. Uh, really been interested in undertaking a huge projects of this type in the St. Bernard Parish. What we really envision this as being kind of a cottage industry and uh, it, it kind of leads into what, the, what I'd like to close with. And that is, uh, you know, the, 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 here's, here's some things that I've showed you that we can do. The people in, in this parish are quite capable of building concrete barges, of deploying them in the water, of managing fish farms, of building oyster reefs. And uh, we, we're sitting here in this room tonight. 
uh, at the gateway to this whole area of restoration. We're going to spend billions and billions of dollars of public money on restoring this area of the coast. The primary reason is to protect your homes in the city of New Orleans and so forth and so on. But the spin-off of that is a huge new opportunity for us. You know, it's an industry that does not exist. And I would propose to you uh, that we're in the perfect spot to take advantage of that and to use it as the cornerstone for our whole rebuilding of St. Bernard Parish. Envision, if you will, uh, Parish Road coming off as, as a spar of the interstate system, 510, uh, with the huge traffic on, on I-10, being the gateway to, to the parish and being a waterfront community uh, where we would have uh, places as we've had traditionally to bring our fishing fleet in to sell, to repair them, sell their projects. But we need some restaurants. We need good chefs. We need some art shops. We need some ecotourism. Uh, we need a cluster, a focal point for exhibiting to the world how we are managing this estuary and how we're recovering from Katrina and how we're rebuilding this whole region. Picture, if you will, uh, further development of, of courses in this college that would train young people to be the technicians and the managers of that restoration and the harvesters of that resource. You know, this, in, in, in my view, uh, right here tonight, we're, we're, we can start that process. But to make it happen, we have to go beyond concepts. We have to go beyond drawing lines on maps, move them into concrete reality, like shell and concrete, and to insist to fight for the dollars, to insist that they are implemented here uh, in this place uh, at this time. Uh, it's a challenge for all of us, and uh, I, I am excited about it. I'm very, very pleased, again, I said that earlier, to be here with you and a part of this. I think I've been through a lot with the people in this parish, and I, I think there's, there's some more than a few rays of hope uh, we're going to come out of this room. Thank you very much.